The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Mason Stevens Limited, ABN 91141 447 207, AFSL 351 578, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Decision. The opinions expressed within the podcast are solely the individuals and do not reflect the opinions and beliefs of Mason Stevens. Hello and welcome. My name is Brendan Dade, Senior Financial Advisor at Lorica Partners. Thank you for joining me on this deep dive into all things investment committees. We'll be talking about how to start one, how to make the most of this part of an advice business, and some of the best practices uh, that go into making these work really well. It will be a four-part series where we hear from some of the leading minds about how to make investment committees work. Thanks for joining me. This series is brought to you by Mason Stevens, a specialist wealth platform provider that focuses on managed account solutions. Recognized by Investment Trends in 2023 as the most improved platform and by advisor ratings in 2022 for best advisor support, Mason Stevens offers outsourced CIO services that complement their platform and managed account solutions. Established in 2010, Mason Stevens is led by some of Australia's most experienced finance and investment professionals. Hello and welcome to this first episode in a great new series that we'll be covering in this podcast in everything about investment committees. Uh, I am joined today by Jackie Fernley, who's the CIO at Mason Stevens, and Andrew Height, Managing Director at Height Capital. Good morning, or no, good afternoon. Sorry, a bit slow off the mark here. Uh, good afternoon, Jackie and Andrew. How are you? Great. Thank you, Brandon. Lovely to be Hi, here. Brandon. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Not a problem at all. Look, I'm very keen to to get stuck in here. Uh, we're going to be talking about the initial stages of setting up an investment committee, and for advisors who are sort of considering this as a path to take in their own practice. Uh, maybe they've they've come across the term, they've heard of other people who are doing it. Uh, maybe they're some way down the journey and want to get the most value out of this component of their business. And they're going to be tuning in to hear from the experience of others. And so we really appreciate you sharing your, your time today. Um, Andrew, I might start with you if I can. Uh, do you mind just giving me a quick background uh, on yourself and of your business? Thanks, Bernard. Um, yes, so High Capital was started seven years ago um, on the basis of trying to provide holistic advice for clients in a, in a range between, um, between a million dollars and $5 million in net worth. Um, and we built a strategy around um, or, or built a model around the um, what we call the three pillars of wealth, which is savings capacity of a client and utilisation of that savings capacity into a wealth strategy and looking at how we compound that return based on their risk objectives and then how they're going to use that money. So the drawdown strategy in behind that. And that still feels part of our of most of our strategy or most of our, um, our business model today. And we still do that on a daily basis with clients. And I guess um, the the main part of this um, of this point is that our wealth strategy is talked about. You know, what is your objectives and how do we um, implement those strategies to get the return that you require um, to live a, a prosperous and free and financial life um, into into retirement or pre retirement and, and achieve those objectives you're looking to do. Excellent, excellent, and. And tell me a little bit about uh, about your business. How, how many how many staff roughly? Have yeah, we're sitting at um, yeah. So we're sitting at ten staff. We have about one hundred and thirty clients. Um, the business client base has sort of changed a little bit. Obviously, that was our objective of having that client base. Um, but I guess I can, my background came from um, boutique financial planning firms, um, and I worked at one of the first um, fee for service independent firms in Australia um, when I first started in this industry. And we um, we grew that business up, um, and I exited and started this business um, on my own with a sort of a very basic model around that that core. Um, we we advise um, our, our core clients are either self funded, all of them are self funded retirees, um, and some some pretty smart business operators. 
We also have an accounting, a very small accounting arm that helps um, with those business clients. It allows us to live up uh, the service that we want to um, deliver to them on a, ba- on a daily basis. So. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Jackie? Yes. Thanks again for having me. Um, Mason Stevens is a platform, but we're a platform that focuses on managed accounts. The whole business is set up um, to support and grow wealth practices and scale them. So a managed account, in our view, that process um, is, is a little bit difficult and um, arduous in so far as transforming a wealth practice into a wealth practice that focuses on managed account solutions and can be a little bit daunting. But the the benefits of scaling a wealth practice in a really compliant manner um, are worth it. And so we, our whole business philosophy and our partnership approach um, is focused on supporting wealth practices on that journey and then growing with them over time. Excellent. And you provide expertise on the, in the investment space and you're, you sit on investment committees, I believe, consult to investment committees. Um, tell us a little bit more about that work. That's right. I'm the chief investment officer and my role within the business is that support function. We work with many of our advice practices in a varied approach. Some wealth practices come to us already with a wonderful asset consultant that's working with them or they might come to us and require more support. And we'll so we face the client where they're at, um, and can wrap our services around them. And so we have everything that a wealth practice may require, in terms of being able to transition onto a managed account platform and, and change their business practices and process, to supporting the advice thereafter once that tr- transition has occurred. Uh, so I have a big team around me, and we can essentially manage capital in multi-asset portfolios through any implementation that may be required. Excellent. And to be clear for our audience, um, Jackie, you don't sit on Andrew's uh, uh, committee, but maybe you know by the end of this conversation, he'll want you on there. <laughs> That's right. I don't sit on Andrew's committee. He has um, two wonderful external um, independents, but Andrew and I chat regularly uh, and um, I often will pop into investment committees as required um, and as I said, Andrew is is a great advocate of Mason Stevens and works with us closely. Um, anyway, and it's a very good um, point there. Like the ability to soundboard against Jackie and the investment specialists that Mason Stevens has allowed me to develop a more knowledgeable and more skill set in our team and our um, investment committee. And that's I think that's the benefit we've found with using Mason Stevens. Is I'll probably class them as the implementers. Um, they're giving us the structure and the infrastructure to implement the MDI, um, but yeah, and then the ability to soundboard where we need to, and if we if we have to, is always there, and it's been very helpful for us over over a period of time. Excellent, excellent. Um, Andrew, I'm I'm curious for for you. Was there a time where you sort of had the light bulb go off and go, you know what, we really need to do. We we really need to set up an investment committee. <laughs> was was this something that you started? Um, when you went out and set up on your own, or is this? Yeah, um, no, it was. I've actually had two cracks of the investment committee, and I'll talk you through the failed and the the good and the bad. Um, Brilliant, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I always thought, as a sort of a, a sole practicing firm originally, the need for external um, cons- contributors was really needed. I think um, if you think you know it all, you're kidding yourself to a certain degree. You can't be over. You can't be over all areas that you need to be over. Um, so originally we started with um, we started with um, a group of um, people I knew from the industry across many different specific asset classes and it didn't really work because we had too many people too specialized that then didn't actually have the knowledge over the overarching knowledge to then come down the view of well what well why do I need to vote on adding a stock to the portfolio? I'm here to talk about property. Um, and so we had this whole, I had this sort of, it was going okay, but it was really, it was like bogged in the mud. We were moving forward, but we were moving forward really slowly. Um, so that's that, that first attempt, I kept one of them um, out of that, but she was more of a specialist in financial planning. So she, her and I had worked together for nearly um, 15, 15 years at that point in time. Um, and so she stayed on and then we cleaned the decks and sort of went more of a, 
more well rounded people that were more client focused and client directed. So people that understood that when you're advising clients, what it feels like and the importance of the strategy and the diversification and um, and then sourced, um, if we need a discussion on property or we want to get a bit more um, confidence around the property strategy, we'll go and source that externally. And similar to what we talked about before, Jackie, um, the utilisation of, um, you know, oh, Jackie, have you seen this fund, fund manager and what's he doing? Um, and brushing it past her just gives us the ability to um, make sure that the overarching strategy is still working, but the capabilities in the team are we are here to focus on our clients and not get caught in the, in the ring roll. Um, on top of that, we've also then, from that second, uh, on the second one, we've gone down to four key members. Mm-hmm. Three of them are independent. Um, so two are uh, international specialist, specialists, um, and they run our international portfolio. And then we have another lady that's our fixed interest specialist, and she runs, and she was previously an advisor, so she's got a lot of knowledge about that client and I use her as my bit of a sniff test, you know, does it make sense to do this transaction? Um, because, you know, some things sound great, but the marginal difference they create for a client is sometimes not worth the, the actual cost of doing it. Um, so she's very important. She's our chair in that part of it. And then what we also did in the second one is we had, they are all members of the investment committee, but then we gave them isolated sleeves of portfolios to, um, build from so one group looks after the fixed interest one group looks after the Australian equities and property Australian property and the other group looks after the international portfolio because of that spinning wheels in the mud kind of experience we had in the first um, evolution of our board um, we decided that it was really good to maybe give them the keys to the Ferrari and let them actually implement and let them not control them and I, a lot of research was done around this for um, my point of view, and there was a good research report that I found, which was Richard Innes's portfolio, where he talks about this and the need to split up roles in not just in this part, but also across your firm. And one of his main points is let the professionals execute what they're meant to do and make sure that you're referencing them back to the investment policy and the investment strategy that you've set them and don't get them tied down into process. Just let them right. be and let them operate. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, you, you, you've uh, it sounded like uh, you well and truly jumped in the deep end. Uh, you, you found <laughs> you you found the propeller heads that you wanted to work with, and um, and it didn't quite get the result. I mean, if, if I think it might be helpful just to sort of zoom out and, and back it up just a little bit, um, yeah. a, a, as far as getting started, because you covered off a, off on a bunch of things there, and I, I I understand why because I imagine that yeah, if you if you know the expertise you like. It uh, makes a lot of sense to sort of go, great, let's let's get these guys, let's bring them in and, and, and that'll work. But um, I can see Jackie sort of smiling as if she's seen all of this before <laughs> and is about to help us with what may be a more sensible way to maybe get started in the, those initial first steps. You know, what, what are the first big questions and the first big things that you need to do um, now that Andrew has graciously shared his, um, you know... Um, Maybe, can we call it a false start, Andrew? Is that a yeah that a right? false yeah. start and then cre- recreation? Yeah, nice, no, nice. No, <laughs> yeah, Andrew's story is is a well trodden path, and there are reasons why I exist and my team exists, but also other the ecosystem of asset consultants that sit around this business exist. That they're, they're the yeah. <laughs> you feel like um, that now. no, it's not about Andrew. It, it, it is the fact that. You don't know what you don't know till you live it. And the reality is the lived experience informs the decisions you make thereafter. And the benefit Andrew had was he sat around the table, he worked out it didn't work, and he pivoted, and now he's got the right ingredients. So how do you get it right the first time is really about the rules of engagement and making sure that the people sitting are in that room know what they're doing, how they're doing it, the delegated authority is in place. And so you can run an efficient meeting and get the right outcomes if you do the hard work in the beginning. And unfortunately, the hard work in the beginning um, is around the purpose and scope of that investment committee. What does it exist to do? In what way? And then you can implement. So what I mean by that is 
first and foremost, you need an investment committee charter. So that investment committee charter determines exactly what mandates are being run, by whom and how. And so you build that out in the first instance. And that might sound daunting. We have templated strategy investment committee charters that we work with clients with to actually ask them the questions and sort of template it through. And because we can ask the right questions because we've done this before, it kind of takes you through that journey. And once you've got your investment committee charter and your investment philosophy built out, you then can understand what you need in your investment committee setting. So when I talk about investment philosophy, it's how do you run that capital? What do you believe around how to invest? Now, often we can template that too and then nuance for each client, but a lot of Australian wealth practices really talk to protecting capital first and then growing it second, using a multi-asset approach, diversification. They're all standard tools in the toolkit. You just really need to eke out exactly what that means for that wealth practice. Mm-hmm. So someone like Andrew and and Hyde Capital utilizes quite a number of direct investments. So Andrew's got direct equity, in, direct international equity, property, etc. So he's delivering to his client base quite a bespoke curated solution. Whereas many other advisors might actually run a 100% multi-managed fund, multi-asset portfolio that really doesn't have much of a tilt from a dynamic asset allocation. I'm not poo-pooing either. Both are valid. But before you go too far, you really need to understand what is it that is my value proposition to my end client? What am I selling? Um, And, you know, Today, as a financial planner and an advisor, the most important thing, and we know this, is the relationship that you're actually providing and growing with your client, the strategic advice that's being delivered, which will set that client up for the long term. And then the investment piece can be managed in that investment committee Mm -hmm. once you've got the framework and the structures set in place. That's a really good point, I think, Jackie, about the understanding of exactly what you want to deliver because it takes a lot of time. If you are not structured properly, um, it takes a lot of time to define that, but then actually to run it and implement it, it takes a substantial amount of resources on top of that to deliver it as well. So, so what I hear you both saying is that you you really need to get a, a grip um, before anyone else can come and help you. Um, you really need to answer for yourself uh, or, you know, what, what you want to do as a practice, what you want to deliver to your clients and get a bit of a sense around what the boundaries of that are. So if it is, you know, say a, a more passive approach, is it is it that you might include a satellite or, or you're never going to do that or do you use, you know, maybe private markets or something and just make sure that you've got a clear philosophy about whatever that is. And equally, if it's something, you know, more bespoke, like perhaps Andrew's practice, where you're going down the direct path, that you've got to be clear about what that's aiming to deliver as well. And if you can build all of that into your investment philosophy and your uh, and your investment committee charter, then great. You 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 sort of you're on the starting blocks. You you're ready to go. That's exactly right. And that part it requires sometimes to get all those stakeholders in a room. I often find myself whiteboarding in a boardroom with all the key stakeholders in that wealth practice just to facilitate a conversation and get the buy-in. There'll, there'll be advisors sitting around the room, especially in a traditional wealth practice, who all have different back books, who have different ways in which they actually offer up a solution to their end client. And we need to sort of facilitate that conversation to get them all on the same page and work out the typical 80-20 rule. You can deliver up a suite of portfolios that actually um, cater for 80% of the clients and then bespoke other solutions around that to get to the 100. But it's really about working that out, getting your investment philosophy and process and all your governance set in place, and then you can work out who do you need in the room. But you've got to do, unfortunately, that 
pre-work to then be able to develop an IC thereafter because that includes how do we make a decision? Who gets to vote? On what? Where's the delegated authority? We have this list of questions that we go through and and it, it sort of takes an advice practice through that journey because we've done it many times. Um, and what we're trying to do is get you through that process with the least amount of hurdles and the least amount of mistakes so that your end goal is is getting into a managed account solution and an investment committee that's working right the first time. Yeah, sure. I think it's a really important step from a practicing point of view to actually go through that process because it's actually a, like a key definitive process that as a team your team should know and what we've found is that we've because we've gone through the MBA process our team's a lot more structured around knowing how we're implementing the portfolios why we're implementing them that could they sit the team actually sits on the committee even though they don't have a vote on it the whole team sits there and listens to the um the external presenters come in and talk about what they're seeing how they're seeing it so that when they do go to the clients they actually got some context of why things are happening as they are um but the core come back to it is by having a really structured and understanding a, a good understanding of that policy um we find it really easy to an easy sell because we, we've worked out worked through all the steps and questions that we potentially could have from a client and actually have the clear descriptive nature of how we're going to manage it yeah sure that's, that's really interesting andrew so you've got you've got your whole team sitting in on all the committee meetings. How many committee meetings do you do per year? Uh, we do four a quarter. Um, we don't have the whole team. We have um, three other members. So the the main advisor that's with us, um, the associate advisor, and then we have a guy that does our, like, manages the portfolios from a training perspective. So he does right. all the implementation across the whole firm. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Um, and both, all three of them sit in just so that they're over the, and across the, the strategies and how we're implementing it. From that point of view and but obviously the other theory behind it is to give them the education and the knowledge to allow them to actually step up onto the committee at some point and take on some of these responsibilities that um that we find ourselves and i'd also add to that brendan um that's fairly standard so we would have um one or two internal voting members um sometimes more but it's generally one or two but we would have observer rights sitting across the key stakeholders within the business so that they feel confident um, in order to know what's going on, to be able to share that with their end client. Um, we'll often record the investment committee so that it's it's there and available for the, for the broader business. And as Andrew said, it, it's really very much a learning um, experience uh, for the broader business to be knowledgeable on on what's actually happening in markets and and give them the confidence and the trust that the portfolios are being managed appropriately. Very transparent. So, yeah, we record all our investment committee meetings so we can be transparent. It's good from um, a point of view like, oh, you know, we were talking last week about X with one of our members and, oh, can we go back to that point in time in our investment committee and get the graph that he was showing on the screen so it's really interactive from that point of view to allow us to drive um, discussions for our clients and the staff members around it. Yeah, excellent. And look, I mean, we're we're talking around this issue, but I know it's a it's a big one and a big consideration for uh, for businesses to think about when they're going down this path. It's the question of who, right? Who sits on the committee? Um, who has various levels of interactions? Um, I'm I'm going to assume that we're just talking about sort of voting people at, at this stage and, and maybe externals. Jackie, I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, how you go about determining who should be sitting on a committee. Always tricky um, and there's always politics. <laughs> um, but what I like to do is um, really use a skills matrix because there's nothing better than being really clear about what do you bring to the conversation, what are your skills, and what role are you playing? Because that that again, that just forces the issue. And you know, I find myself regularly in 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 the middle. Um, and there's nothing better than making the whole thing transparent. Just like a board, 
um, an IC is run like a board. And so you need to make sure that you've got the right skills in the room. And so internally, generally the advice business, the the la- the the advisors are selling a, a are essentially their role is to provide that strategic advice to be out in market acquiring clients and then focusing their attention on that client relationship and client retention. And they're selling in a in a managed account solution, an MDA or an SMA, they're essentially attaching each client to each portfolio that is managed within the investment committee setting. Um, so most of the time, those advisors aren't well equipped to sit in an investment committee. It's unusual that they are. But at the same time, we need one or two voices from the business to ensure that we remain within mandate and remain relevant to that client, the client base. And when I say they're not equipped, that's not a derogatory comment. That's just the reality of mastering markets and being across markets takes a lot of time. And often it's quite technical. And so it's very difficult to run a a wealth practice to build the client base, to do the strategic advice and be across all the technical requirements from a strategic advice perspective and be across markets and all the different implementations. If anyone can actually do all of it really well, who are you? Because I think you're a genius, right? (laughs) Yeah. Um, it's very difficult. So you have to pull in the skills um, for specialists to a degree um, and also have enough someone in the room that can talk across the um, asset consult, uh, the asset classes and has sufficient knowledge to, to put the pieces together um, because it, it's quite complicated. Mm. And Andrew, did, you know, sort of reflecting on your first experience, having someone to be able to sort of sit across those different components is something maybe that, that wasn't gelling to kick off, but you've sort of you're yeah. now in a much better spot. Is that what yeah, you, I think, Jack um, was alluding to? Yeah. yeah, I think the the experience that we've had is um, originally, yeah, the, the, not the lack of knowledge, but the focus on all the information you need to consume and understand to get an outcome. Um, is really important. Um, that was probably the first initial realization on that that board structure. I think the other thing we actually also changed and we've manipulated this into it is actually give everyone sleeves of asset classes or specialization areas so that the portfolios are being really well managed by that specialty. And that was the first sort of point of call from our point of view. Um, about giving these members sleeves to look after and responsibilities around that. And my theory on that is that they, they can then lit by the sword, die by the sword. So if they've been engaged to run it as an international portfolio manager and they're not performing, well, your asset allocation views at the top don't matter because I'm engaging you to run that inter- international portfolio. So yeah, right. the, the the breakdown and tasks and the, and the roles everyone plays – um, in our group, has been really defined uh, a lot, and 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 it's in, it's evolved in the last twelve months a lot more because of the the decisions around. I don't want to be stuck in the mud. I want to keep moving, and I want to be dynamic. And if I'm going to run direct portfolios, we need to be dynamic in our investment approach to allow us to get the right returns for clients. And that that meant that we you know we went from having a you know a democratic process to being sleeve based, decision based. Um, they present the opportunity to get more of an asset allocation towards their portfolio and the committee at the top makes a decision because of the reasons they've presented. But at the end of the day, they've got 20% in the international portfolio. That's their way, that's their portfolio weight, and that's the way they're going to work towards. If they've got 40%, that's what they've got to work towards. And they'll, as I said, they'll live by the sword, die by the sword. Coming back to um, Jackie's role, we've split those quest, um, points Jackie made out before. We split those two roles about advisor and the investment committee up internally a little bit. So the advisor is really responsible for the daily management of the client. So they look after the three pillars of wealth that we talked about. They look about the client's need for cash and liquidity and liability expectations. They look after the risk profiling and make sure the client's in the right model. Um, And then the investment committee itself and the members of the committee and the investment managers, they're in charge of what makes up the Aussie equity waiting for that client? What makes up the fixed interest waiting for that client? 
why we how are we creating the returns what weightings are we putting into core value and growth models in each asset class or each risk profile and we work through that and we manage that as a single entity strategy on its own and then we leave the advisors to really do the day-to-day management of those those clients on a cash requirement and what they need and then we leave the portfolio management to a third party which is really um it's working really well from our point of view because as jackie pointed out before the advisor's role is to create the relationship manage the relationship deliver the service to the client so that they are comfortable in what what the way they are financially and their financially freedom is their core objective leave the investment management side to the guys to really work that part of their their, their job is to find opportunities that create returns for clients yeah yeah interesting and look you know i'm conscious that we're talking sort of here in the context of um an mda implementation for for you andrew um and it's it's obviously a, a licensing requirement that you need an investment committee to to run uh, an MDA. But uh, but when I first started, sorry, when I first started, I didn't have I didn't have a MDA in place. I originally wanted one just for the sounding board that I needed across the firm. Oh, good. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm sort of curious about that element as well. You know, if um, if you're a practice that doesn't have doesn't have a desire necessarily to go down the SMA or, or MDA path. Uh, do you think that changes how an investment committee should function? Um, you know, what are the sort of considerations if if that's not really somebody's headspace um, at, at this point? Would you say it's all it's all pretty much the same, or would would there be tweaks to to how you go about setting something up? I think it comes back to that investment committee charter. Mm-hmm. Or your investment charter it doesn't have to be committee. Take the committee out of it because I looked at I don't know a lot of firms that don't even have the A one bloke looks up Morningstar the model Morningstar model and that's his investment decision, um, and that's how he waits. So if you look back to your charter, I think the the dilemma will be if you're just running a dimensional model or a Vanguard model, then maybe it's okay having no external input. Um, you're still going to have to source some form of research around your asset allocation. Yeah, I I find that having externals it changes the conversation. It creates such good context about you know some of our committee. One's in America at the moment, um, uh, and his knowledge and process of what he's seeing over there substantially changes the view of what we're expecting to see in America. You know, one guy's in Perth, so he sees a lot more. He meets with a lot more mining executives than we do because of the knowledge base he's got. So. Having that real diversity and content coming back to us that is real live data, not waiting for your morning stars and long sex to write a 15 page report, just provides that real context. Now, obviously, we don't use Mason Stevens nor Jackie on our investment committee, but then to utilize Mason Stevens in bulk or their investment sleeve service for research, access to data, access to the analyst side of things. Um, it just gives us context to, oh, I really like this stock idea, but oh, do it like if eighty percent of advisors are using Morningstar and it's in their model, well, that means it's going to be held by a large amount of people. But is there any other research out there that I should be utilizing to make a decision? And it's about finding those pillars that help you deliver that. The access to the data is probably the key that I find um, the benefit of having externals being involved in our approach. Mm. Um, Jackie, curious to, about your thoughts for um, you know for those who are necessarily implementing via an MDA and 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 some of the differences around the charter and that sort of thing. Yeah, first and foremost, if you're within a traditional wealth practice and you're using a Morningstar portfolio or a, a Lonsec or whomever, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, but the one thing you're what you ha- essentially need to do is you're you're then attaching one one client by one client to a managed account or or a solution that works for that individual client and that is again nothing wrong with it but then you're 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 competing for clients in a manner where it's then very diffi- difficult to differentiate your wealth practice from the one who's doing exactly the same thing um and so in order to differentiate and to consider um a range of solutions or a more scaled offering, um, running 
uh, model or running an MDR or an SMA is quite valuable in that context. But it, it isn't necessarily the be all and end all. But I think from a scale and compliance perspective, it's it's the most profitable way to run a wealth practice. Um, is probably the key thing to note there. Um, but having said that, the quality of the conversation that you as a wealth as an advisor can have when your um, world is informed by broader than just you sitting in a room or a small team sitting in a room, the caliber and the quality of the conversation just increases, which is what Andrew's just talked to. Um, and so in order to actually grow your business and differentiate, in my mind, the MDA or the SMA solution is quite compelling from that perspective. The alternative as well is being in a larger organisation where there's an internal investment committee uh, and an inver- internal research team who are offering up a paper portfolio. That's often also the case. But what happens in that environment is that that wealth manager or that advisor doesn't have discretion And so whenever there's a change in that portfolio, that advisor needs to ring each client individually. That can take, and I've seen it myself, three to six months, sometimes longer for those conversations, those SOAs or ROAs to be written in order to affect that change. The decisions for that advisor, who do I ring first, all of that, I mean, it's it, it's fraught. Now, it, taking you back to those dark days, Jackie's <laughs> point. <laughs> it is just fraught with conflicts. It's it's hard yeah. and it's difficult. You know, but that's the, one of the reasons why we implemented an MDA um, per se. We were a non-discretionary operating business three years ago. And the need for consolidation of this trading bit, as we got, it was okay when we had 40 clients and we could email them all and they'd be all really interactive. But as you incrementally get a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, the ones that actually lose out are your smaller clients because they're the last and the least to be called. So we've sort of changed our mindset and said, well, the MDA fits those smaller clients. He's better. They get a better outcome too. Um, that they that fits their fits their needs and balances. Now we still have those big clients that want to be in the conversation around why and how you're doing it. But the MDA just means that we actually make a decision, it's implemented today. Instead, two or three weeks' time, by the time we've seen an authority to proceed to come back from a client, and I'll give a great example, right? In the model, we traded Macquarie at $226, I think it was. We then went out to the rest of the clients. By the time we actually got the ATBs back, the share price had fallen from $226, $220 to $180, Yeah, well, not not worth doing anymore. So we'd miss that opportunity to trim. You miss opportunities to trim and take profits at the right times um, without using the MDA because as your book gets bigger and the tail gets longer, you really it's really hard to implement. Yeah, so I, I guess what I hear you saying um, is that there's a logical progression to this. Um, you start with <clears throat> you start with something maybe simpler, something a little bit more basic, but then as you bring in externals and you get a, a better quality conversation, you get more robustness around the process, and then you know, you have the the logical next step might be how do we get this? Yeah, how how do we get this this uh, the good news out to to clients faster, right? Yeah, I'll give you a good example. A good example of that, Brendan, is um we did international managed funds for decades. We've been doing international managed funds, but running a direct portfolio internally. Um, with the inclusion of the external um in international managed specialists, we're actually realizing that. Hey, we could be more tangible with moving from value to growth. We can be more tangible with holding more core assets for a longer period of time than the managers do. Um, and so we've transitioned with that knowledge base. We've been able to transition some of our portfolio away from the managers and to a direct portfolio and, and trying to understand why we're putting in your Apples and your Microsofts and, and you know, long-term structural changes uh Globally, is one of the areas that we've been able to ben- we've been beneficially been able to do with the inclusion of external consultants. Yeah, excellent. Um, I- I'm curious. You know, we talked about the investment philosophy uh, to to start off with. Do you see 
um, maybe Jack, in your experience, do you do you see that once an investment philosophy is is finally articulated by a practice, um, it, do you see that that sort of changes over time or evolves um, through the work of the investment committees, or is that something that sort of stays foundational and then sort of continues to support them? Well, what do you see the role? Well, the interplay between sort of the firm's investment philosophy and the investment committee. Now, I think the philosophy is probably, if it's done well in the first instance, doesn't really change. It's quite a timeless um, piece of work. What does change and iterate is the investment process. Gotcha. As you live and breathe investing those portfolios and the nuances of them, you then find out what are the things that we missed in the, in the conversation because you are you get case studies all the time. How do we make this decision? Yeah. How do we size this, this position? Uh, how do we work through when to sell a managed fund? Whilst we can help, or a stock for that perspective, but mm. whilst we can help um, iron out a lot early, the reality is that... Um, there's always things that come through where I can't. I I generally see an investment process document somewhat live until you've um, stretched it you, and you've actually lived it for a little while. Right. Um, and then you keep you you, you do adjust. Um, but beyond that, um, these policies and processes should actually be quite robust in the first instance and then they iterate and then you might need to change it for a new world but I tend to to think that really what you then do is find a new you potentially need a new mandate or, or a new solution because all of a sudden you've grown your business and then all of a sudden you're wanting to do impact portfolios or you want to go after the charitable market or you want to do something where the suite of core portfolios that you have don't actually provide the right solution and then you start adding on. Mm. That, that's a year or two down the track once you've got all your clients into the suite of models or, or, or managed portfolios that are on platform mm -hmm. and then you go, okay, now I need a ESG this or a... But it doesn't really change your charter though, does it, Jackie? It's still, your charter still should really be defined at the inception point and the sleeves and how you deliver your charter might alternate and change but your charter i i, I find it hard to change our charter anytime soon unless there's a substantial structural change you've been at it for some time though andrew so uh, <laughs> you know it might some others might take a, a little bit longer to catch on i mean it'd be interesting just maybe to zoom in as, as a hypothetical example right you're an investment committee, um, you've been going, you've sat sort of three or four times and there's a fund maybe that's underperforming and you you may have got a templated set of questions about how you measure the fund, right? It might be, I don't know, costs, pick your favourite ratio, um, the relevant time periods of performance. Um, and if it's starting to fall down on maybe some of those Inevitably, there's some other question or some other reason that might pop up by one of the committee members to either keep or reject that fund that is maybe not part of the initial set of questions. So then do you up, you know, upend and redo the questions? Is that the sort of like process example that you're talking about there, Jackie? Yeah, it, it could very well be. And I think um, you can always improve an investment process and you can always find an example or something may happen where you've really not captured that in your process. So that's what I talk about in terms of it being a little bit of a live document. But to Andrew's point, the core pieces, which is your your IC charter, your investment philosophies and beliefs, they really shouldn't be moving really at all. Nor should your strategic asset allocation, the asset classes that you've chosen to invest behind, um, those are the things that you sort of really do set and then um, it's just that process piece uh, where you, you might often iterate. And I think to sort of capture a little bit more, Brendan, the other things I see that change um, are what data and what information does that investment committee actually need when they meet? So making sure that agenda's right and then making sure you've got the analytics. 
So one of the pieces of work, and, and Andrew has seen some of this, is we are working with um, Jacobi Analytics. So we have an open API into and out of Jacobi, which is an institutional grade portfolio analytics tool that's used globally. Uh, we now provide analytical reports, portfolio reports into our investment committees so that that investment committee is sitting there with the information. They're looking at how their managers actually performed and they can see it. It's black and white. The data is there. So if you're sitting with all that information, it's much easier to go, our rule is that if a manager underperforms for two years or 18 months, it goes on the list. It goes on the list of there's the naughty corner. We're going to review that manager and go through our process, check into that performance and change them out if they're not actually doing the job they're meant to do. Mm. So the key to that though, Jackie, is trying to find them early enough because once they become a dog in your box, it's only too late. So, you know, the old <laughs> moment, yeah, though, the cash cow <laughs> versus the dog, um, it's, it's, it works in this mandate all the time. But you got to have the analytics, and this is one of my points that I was going to allude into this, is the analytics, and we do it on our own in our own um, matrix of um, reviewing, the analytics is core. Knowing when stocks are either performing or underperforming, doing it from the managed fund point of view, but you've got to be on top of them because before you know it, they can blow up and they blow up way too quickly and they can blow up and you don't even know about it and they can blow up your, your system and even though they make up a small portion of your portfolio potentially, it hurts. Um, so having that a detailed analytical alignment to what are they doing, how are they doing it, reporting that back and aligning that back to your charter. So while we've been talking about coming down the, the, the stream of data and how you build an investment committee, you also need to build the structure back up to report on how you're achieving what you're trying to set out to do. And um, we've, we've built that in our own system because we are running direct equities. It makes it a little bit harder because fund managers are really hard to get the data on where they sit in the scheme things. Um, but from our investment portfolio management, one of our tools that every week, um, our analyst here actually runs a full-on 15-page analytics around the investment process and the reporting of that internal performance of that fund. So if a client does call up, we know that that stock's underperforming and we're, we're on top of it before the client gives the call and say, well, what's happening here? So, no, Andrew, I mean, that sort of naturally leads into a question about, you know, if someone's considering starting an investment committee and they're sort of taking stock of all the things which you need, <clears throat> reporting and analytics being a, a really important one. Clearly, this is going to change depending on what type of implementation you've got and what sort of you know models you're looking to run. I, I imagine that your models are, are certainly in the more um, intensive end of the spectrum, yeah. uh, being, being with the amount of direct um, investments that you hold. But is there, can you give us a bit of a sense of what sort of time investment is needed. I mean, you just mentioned a, a fifteen-page report once a week. I'm, I'm hoping that that uh, wouldn't take it. Yeah, I was going to say I was going to hope it doesn't take the same. Uh, it takes me to do <laughs> yeah. to, to write a fifteen-page report. Um, no, no, so we obviously engage a, um, a platform like a Bloomberg or a FactSet or a um, Refinity data system to give us a lot of that analytical data. So it is in there, and it is it is actually readily available. And we do that, like we keep that portfolio up to date so we can pull the data really efficiently. Um, so that's the first thing is you might not want to spend, if you want to go down the route of really being analytical on a direct portfolio, you do need to probably spend some form of money um, on building that structure. Um, and it does come down to, you know, as you go through it, how do you analyze it is going to be really important to allow you to make decisions in a timely manner because if your asset allocation is, and even if you're an index model and you want to move from emerging markets to de developed, you've got to have some form of trigger to make you do that. Mm. And that's the things that we've, over 50, 20 years of working in this industry and working for one of the um, boutiques originally a long time ago that was more about inform information and developing strategies for the retail client, it, give, it gave me the tools we, wish, we still utilise today about, well, when is a market overvalued? When's it undervalued? And those kind of triggers and then what funds are actually in the right 
categories to give me the outcome I'm looking for. There's some of the questions that they're probably already doing. They just probably need to formalize it a bit better. Right. Jack, I'd be curious to hear from from you on the on the simpler end of the spectrum. You know, what sort of time investment should people be thinking about and, and how should they think about sort of resourcing this exercise or, or the committee and bringing, like Andrew says, some of the, the formality and structure to decisions they're probably already making now, <laughs> but maybe just not in, 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 a, in a formal process. And I, I think if we if we just stay, step back for a moment, what we're trying, what we're talking about is delivering better client outcomes from an investment perspective and consistent client outcomes across the business, across the client book. This supports compliance across your wealth practice and it saves you money in a lot of places if implemented well. So that's the first piece of the puzzle is a lot of wealth practices fail to scale uh, because the cost to serve continues to increase because you're not you're providing investment advice that's not well structured in the first instance and therefore you've got to wrap a whole host of compliance around it to make it work. And And the maths of those businesses don't work. Um, so that's the proposition you're solving and what we're talking about is putting it in investment committee structure. And the important piece of this is that there is an ecosystem of support in the industry today that a wealth practice can access. As a wealth practice running an MDA or an SMA, you can charge a fee on that model and split the advice piece and the model fee out. And that income from that model fee can fund the external expertise that you need to actually deliver this solution. So. The big message I want to make sure that we don't scare people away <laughs> because it sounds very complex. There are no doubt traps for young players and there is a certain amount of complexity in delivering up a well-structured investment committee and an MDR and SMA solution. There's no doubt there's a bit there. But that's why the outsource CIO exists within Mason Stevens. That's why the ecosystem around this industry exist to support that transition. And it is well worth it the other end when you get a far more profitable, scaled and compliant wealth practice. Um, and so it might be a little daunting to begin with, but we've done it before and it, and it, and it is well worth the other side. Oh, I think that um, the focus on fees is not really the solution here. I think focusing on the outcome from performance will outstrip the cost of this implementation. Um, you know, by being able to strip out some of the additional costs that you're getting from external already, um, you know, we find the clients get a better outcome by being involved a lot. Like by actually having the extra services, they're actually getting better outcomes um, rather than having um, having just me hope that I've got it right and wanting stars giving me the right data. Um, yeah, yeah, the clients are willing to pay for that, that service, I feel. Sure. Yeah, and look, it, it's clearly going to be a trade-off, I think, that, that a business is going to need to make. Are we going to invest in, um, you know, the, the next sort of future growth of our business in order to make that component of what gets delivered scalable? Um, and I'm sure there's an inflection point somewhere. <laughs> where, and, and, you you know, you, you might be sitting a long way from that inflection point. You might be, you might be past that inflection point. But at some stage, well, I think the, the proposition, Jackie, that you, you're really saying and Andrew, that you've sort of walked out in your practice for some time now is that if you can get scalability around the investment decisions via setting up a investment committee and making sure it runs well, then it allows you to take these other steps, MDA, SMA, whatever implementation suite you decide, and that will then give you the platform for for growth where, you know, the initial costs of all these reporting tools and time within the business and all that sort of stuff start to start to have their own return, both for the clients and for the business. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the, my analytics part, I, I just really, I, I like to have my finger on the pulse, so I'm willing to pay a little bit more to have my finger on the pulse. Um, 
But yeah, there's tools out there like Morningstar in their research facility actually has the has some of their the tools that you could utilize to really just check and put it in the quartiles and see, you know, one quartile you get a review and yeah, you, know, you can actually use tools that you're probably already paying for um, in their models already. And from our perspective, we offer that as one of the suite of services. So we we can provide a, a bespoke portfolio analytics report every month and it and it's part of the rate card. So it just depends on what you as a wealth practice require and it just gets delivered up. And the data that they give us is pretty much the same as what we give what we're all creating anyway. So it's a it's a it's a good checkpoint to say, Oh actually, yeah, that's that's a good add in that we weren't doing. Um, you know, can we do that? So if it's um it's good. It's been. It's. You know, I find it really beneficial from my point of view to make sure that we're we're tracking the right direction. Um, yeah, I feel like that. Um, sometimes you you can, as an advisor, track blind and hope. Um, but yeah, those those research those just checking yourself occasionally can really end up. Yeah. Excellent. Well, guys, this, this has been exceptionally helpful and um and and painting us a picture of of setting up the committee and, and the things to think about and it's been it's been really thorough and I appreciate you sharing your experience. I'd be curious uh, to know um, you know what are the what are the biggest traps for young players as you say Jackie uh, um, as we sort of try and tie a bow around this um, what, what are the main things that you should be con- uh, not concerned but what should you be wary of if you were starting out down this path if you could I know there are many things, but maybe just keep it to some of the common common pitfalls. And also, you know, what's what's one of the encouragements or the the unexpected upsides that you see that a lot of businesses get the value out of and clients get the value out of that maybe people just don't expect from the outset? Uh, I'd be curious to hear from you both. Sure, I think um, the the biggest trap for young young players is ensuring you've got the right partner. Um, or partners, um, I have seen um, asset consultants working with clients who just have investment philosophies and approaches that are completely different to what the wealth practice in, in itself is trying to deliver. Uh, and then the mistake that gets made is how do, does that investment committee actually translate that asset consultant view into a portfolio? So that partnership and who they utilize is just so important because that that's the piece of the puzzle that can fall, fall down. I have a lot of experience and my team have a lot of experience uh, running uh, running this process and we can support that relationship and, and the partnership and who you need. You know, for example, we've just completely reworked one of our clients whole investment governance piece. We've built all their policies. We've restructured their investment committee. We've built a main IC and two additional delegate ICs, one for managed fund selection and one for direct investment, direct equities. There are different external asset consultants on each of those three committees, as well as someone from my team who have the right um, skill sets. So the point of all of that is just that matching of skill sets and the structure you build is so important. And the biggest trap is not getting that right in the first instance. And then the the positive piece of it is whilst it's going to sound quite daunting, it'll be the best thing you do for your business two years down the track. Um, but that process of... Um, one client by one client into the models, getting them structured, making it all happen. Uh, it, 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 it's a bit of a process and I'm not going to pretend that it's not, but the, the the benefits just outweigh it, the other side of the transition. Excellent. Andrew, I'd be cu- curious to hear from you. you know, yeah, what? I think my first point of all this is start talking. Start talking to the people that you're working with, if it's the BDM between your platform, about if it's somebody you want to go towards, just start talking about, well, what do they think? How do they utilize it? You know, if if it's worth going to a, a conference where Jackie's speaking about this, it's it's well worth it because Mason Stevens is well and truly, and I've done a lot of research and I've talked to some of Jackie's major competitors about building this five years ago um, when I first started out on my own, but we just didn't have the scale. But that, that five years of education really helped me 
make the decision around which platform had the solution for me. Um, it made me really understand, well, they can help me, but I need that third party to be involved and I need, but I need help with investment knowledge. So who's going to give me that? Well, not many. Um, so, okay, well, I need a broker on my investment committee, do I? Or, you know, so you start going through this pyramid of questions and skill sets and needs and wants and but if you just start the conversation with somebody, you'll start picking up all the little areas that you need to focus on to then be able to deliver when you get to from 50 mil to 150 and you've got your 100 clients and you're like, well, I now need one. I know all the answers. I know how I'm going to deliver it. I know that I'm already in the process. So I think my first recommendation is sit down with someone you know that's either got one or in a platform sense knows how to operate one. And that, I think, is the best step to understanding where you're going to end up because they've got the tools and they understand how they're going to implement it. Yeah, you know, It's a regular conversation your BDM's having with other platform practices um, and they're going to be able to give you a lot of insight around, well, you could do it this way and you could do it this way. And I think it's a it's a really good starting point to talk to, to that kind of model. Yeah, that's great advice, Andrew. I might just add one more thing, Brendan, um, in terms of sure. answering the, the question, what's the what's the surprise, what's the, the thing? Um, and it is that if I look at our client base at Mason Stevens, some of our larger clients, and it's not just one, it's about three or four right now, who have gone through this transition and run a fully scaled wealth practice running MDAs, they're now buying businesses. And they're buying businesses with books of thumb that are one, two, three times bigger than their thumb. And they can do that because the profitability attached a wealth practice at scale in this format is just materially better than a traditional wealth practice. So they are then able to buy those traditional non-scaled businesses, win in the market in terms of acquiring them because they can pay a little bit more and then tuck them into the suite of portfolios that are often there and then they, they keep continually to build. Uh, and the multiple that they their business themselves is valued at is materially higher than the traditional wealth practices that they're acquiring. Um, the math stand for themselves. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's the win at the end. Yeah, of the it's a good, that's a good point, Jackie, because the ability to scale um, your current advisor list, if someone's looking after 50, if you're doing an MDA with 80% of that client base, they can be holding 100, 120 clients, 150 clients probably under their book if they're not looking after the investment mandate. If they're just purely client services, and and that's a bit that we've found the ability to scale now that we've got an MDA in place, the scalability of our business is three or four fold. And to Jackie's point, we could suck, we could double in size probably with two more staff, three more staff. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just because of the ability to, to make the investment. The time consumption in advice is really in implementing it. It's not giving it, it's it's a little bit of writing it, but the implementation of a managed investment portfolio, uh, the implementation of the strategic advice, that's all your time consumption. And if you can outsource or um, utilize a more efficient way of doing the investment mandate side, my, my experience is that it's, it's substantially better for you and your firm. And the other bit, it takes out all the compliance risk because if everyone's in the model, the investment committee is setting it, the company's got the, the fingers around the, in the mandate and they're in control. When you're non-discretionary, the mandate could be used, it could not be used, and you could end up with little pockets of um, sometimes gold and sometimes not gold <laughs> uh, that actually yeah. can really hurt your business. Mm. And that's yeah. the bit that I really like about it. As we, we grow and as we build this business out, the mandate and the model portfolio give me comfort that we're not taking additional risk by bringing in new advisors because if we can make sure that all the money goes into the model, I know what's in that thing and I know what's happening behind the scenes. Well, Andrew, Jackie, if, if that isn't an encouragement to uh, uh, to roll up your sleeves and, and get curious and, and start to explore these uh, uh, these these next steps that uh, our listeners might be might be curious to take, um, I, I don't know what is. So thank you very much both for your time and uh, we really appreciate you sharing your or, uh, your expertise and, and sharing your wisdom. Thanks, Brendan. Yeah, thanks, Brendan. Great, great to speak. <laughs>